This video is supposed to talk about Cryptococcus neoformans, and it will. But as you know, I'm doing a series of videos right now, particularly about CNS infections. Um, so once again, just like I did for the parasite video, I don't want you to think that Cryptococcus neoformans is the only fungal infection that leads to problems in the brain. Just not true. Um, it's a big one though. Um, there are CNS complications for the HIV community all the time, um, and particularly HIV, but other immunocompromised uh, communities as well, transplant patients, things like that. Um, they can occur in healthy individuals as well, but um, not as often. Um, so what happens is you get some sort of fungal infection um, and they can be spread in either way. They can go hematogenously. So if you had like a fungemia or they can go direct extension. Um, so if you think about back when we talked about things like blastomyces and histoplasmosis, um, blastomyces in particular, I showed the image of the woman with the lesions on her face. Well, when you have lesions on your face or you have um, fungal infections in your sinus cavity, things like that, then it's easy for it to just get over to the brain pretty easy. It's nice, um, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump. So um, we can see them there. So just like I was saying before, we are gonna talk a lot about Cryptococcus neoformans, but there are fungal infections that you've already learned about that might also cause CNS symptoms. Um, one of them in particular is Aspergillus. We've talked about Aspergillus before. We talked about Aspergillus in the Zadie Johnson case in Vital Fluids and Gases. Um, so, and there's actually a separate video for Aspergillus on my YouTube channel, and I left a note for it in your course notes in case you want to go back and review that. Um, but basically, Aspergillus is transmitted normally um, by airway colonization and then with subsequent like allergic reactions to the fungal infection. Um, so you can get colonization of kind of these pre-existing cavities. The, remember, it forms those aspergillomas, which is basically just kind of a ball of Aspergillus. Um, and what we more associate it with is actually the lungs. Dr. Shannon right now is laughing at my poor attempt to grow lungs. So most of the time with aspergillus, we think of lung infections, and this would be like an aspergilloma. But then aspergillus actually has a highly, um, kind of a highly invasive nature. It's a really good at um, invading the vasculature. It's angioinvasive. So what happens is you've got it in the lung, and then it gets like into your bloodstream. It invades into the bloodstream. And then once it's in the bloodstream, it's able to actually travel through the blood so that then you get abscesses. And so in this case, it would travel through the blood over here. And then you'd have all these multiple abscesses within the brain where basically you're seeing these little aspergillomas show up and take root. And so in that case, because we're talking about abscesses, um, you're going to see kind of focal deficits based on where the abscess has formed in the brain. Um, mortality of this particular type of infection, despite antifungal therapy, is pretty high. It's still greater than like 70%. Um, and for aspergillus, or aspergillus infections in the brain, you're going to make a diagnosis using the mycology lab. Um, the organisms can be seen using a high power um, with a silver stain. So you can see it, but it's still um, pretty difficult. So again, we're largely going to talk about cryptococcus now, but I don't want you to forget that there are other important fungal infections that affect the brain, particularly ones like aspergillus. Okay, so now let's talk about C. neoformans specifically. Um, Cryptococcus is a yeast. It's found worldwide in the soil as well as in pigeon guano. Um, there are four different serotypes of it, A through D. Um, which serotype doesn't necessarily matter. You can have infections with any of them. Um, it grows well at 37 degrees um, in about two to four days, so we can easily culture it pretty well. It has this very round yeast form with kind of this narrow based budding that you can see here in the image. Um, typically, it causes a pulmonary infection, so we can definitely associate this with aerosols. And once it is transmitted, it's associated with either asymptomatic disease, pneumonia, or meningitis. 
Um, diagnosis is typically done using an India ink stain, which I'll show you in a minute of the CSF, but culture is actually still the gold standard. Um, you are able to treat this one. Amphotericin is a good treatment. Fluconazole is a good treatment. Um, and that's good because actually there are in instances of um, kind of chronic cryptoformans uh, or cryptococcus infections, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so cryptococcus or cryptococcal infections are a really big concern for the HIV community. Um, it triggers a pulmonary infection when patients inhale the encapsulated yeast spores, but the fungus can actually cause something similar to like a latent infection in immunocompromised patients. And that's actually really key um, because that's actually what's gonna lead to one of two things, cryptococcal meningitis or cryptococcus induced CNS iris. Um, clinically, the patient is gonna show up with headache, malaise, fever, nuchal rigidity, emesis, altered mental state, all things we've come to associate with kind of a meningitis um, the, uh, presentation. But what can happen is that those with kind of this disseminated cryptococcal infection are likely to develop um, meningitis and intracranial lesions and lymphadenopathy and pneumonitis or cutaneous lesions. And then we get scarring, um, which kind of impairs the CSF reabsorption. Now, that's not so big a deal. I mean, it can lead to hydrocephaly, but we can... Um, we can fix that with a shunt. So we can work our way around it as long as we know what we're dealing with. Now, what is exactly this cryptococcal CNS iris? So when you have this disseminated infection, it takes root in the brain, all right? When a patient gets HIV, if they don't know it for a while and they don't get on treatment right away, CD4s go down. When the CD4s go less than 200, they're severely immunosuppressed at that point. Crypto then kind of comes out of hiding and proliferates more. When it proliferates more, it's gonna proliferate more in the brain. So proliferating more in the brain is already a problem because that leads to meningitis. But let's say at this time, before we get to meningitis, we get this patient on antiretroviral therapy. Now their CD4s come back up. So now we're greater than 500. Hooray, all is saved, right? No, because there's this antigen in the brain that has been replicating while the immune system has been sleeping. So all of the cells rush to the brain to try to fix this. It's not that different from when we were talking about PML. They're just rushing in. So what you get is a CNS-mediated immune reconstitution inflammatory disorder um, or syndrome, um, and that's IRS. Um, and it can be, it, it can be very bad. It can be um, pretty debilitating. Okay, so I'm gonna let um, Dr. Poole discuss microscopic examination. But when we are looking for cryptococcus, you can't just use a typical H and E stain. It's cryptic, it's hard to find. You're gonna wanna use silver stain. And like I said before, you can treat it with amphotericin bait. So if we look over here, the organisms are best demonstrated on special stains, such as these crypto, these silver stains, which you can see here. So cryptococcal meningitis, um, you can get just kind of fulminant infection in the brain. You can get disseminated. You can get um, CNS iris as a result of it. Um, and that's part of the reason why in the HIV community, this one is a particularly dangerous pathogen to encounter.